Hey folks, this is the Garden of English. I'm Tim Freitas and I am here the week before your AP exam to give you my top seven tips for how to write a strong rhetorical analysis before exam day. So let's start with number one. Number one, we want to learn how to use the prompt to our advantage. Yes, if you use the prompt to your advantage before you read the passage, you will be able to get so much information that will help you with your reading comprehension. So how do you do that? Well, when you read your prompt, you want to identify the elements of the rhetorical situation. That would be your speaker. That would be the background information of what's prompting your speaker to speak. That's what we call exigence. And we also have your audience involved there as well. We'll talk more about audience when it comes to commentary. But it's super important to identify these things. Also, the prompt over the past few years has been including elements of purpose. So you might get what the speaker actually is trying to get the audience to understand. You might get what the speaker is actually trying to get the audience to do. Uh, typically it's either one or the other, but sometimes it's none at all. But the information is typically in there. So if you can find either the understand or the do for the audience, you have already gotten halfway to the purpose. Now, another way that you can use the prompt is to find what you're commanded to do, which is you're commanded to analyze the piece that's before you. And then if you look in there, after the word analyze, you're going to see the word to followed by a verb. If you look at that, oftentimes you can actually also create a question from the prompt right there that will help you read the piece. So this is why you want to break down the prompt first. So if you go to the word analyze and then you find the word to and then the verb that comes after, you then are going to say, what can't I know after to and then the verb? And whatever the, whatever the answer to that is, is going to be the question that you create. Let me give you an example. In 2015, the College Board released a prompt that said, analyze the rhetorical choices Chavez makes in order to convey his message about nonviolence. So if I go to the word analyze and I look for the infinitive after, it's to convey, and we have to convey his message about nonviolence. If I were to ask, what can't I know before I read this piece, I don't know what his message about nonviolence is. Good, so now I have a question to answer while I read. And that's really strong and really good for us as readers because if I can answer that question when I'm done and realize that he wants people to understand that nonviolence is powerful and therefore they should protest nonviolently, all I then have to do is say, great, where are three pieces or four pieces of textual evidence that showed that to me? And my essay explains how that language shows the power of nonviolence and why that power would move people to protest nonviolently. It's really quite simple. If you can create that question from the prompt, you can actually write only about what you know. Because when you're done reading the passage and if you know the answer to that question, all you need to do is pick out the text that showed you that and explain how that particular text showed you that in this case, nonviolence is powerful. And then you would explain how nonviolent be, nonviolence being powerful would actually move the audience to be nonviolent themselves. It really is quite simple. Now, the past few years, they have been giving uh, a little bit of purpose in the prompt. I think about a few years ago with the uh, Madeline Albright prompt. It says, in order to convey her message that perseverance can make a difference. Good. So you already know her message. You know what the audience is supposed to understand, but you're not told what they're supposed to do yet. So what you're going to then ask before you read is, okay, with the information that perseverance can make a difference, what will the audience then do? If you can answer that question, you just find the text that shows that perseverance can make a difference and you explain how it shows that perseverance can make a difference. You then explain how that same text would move someone to want to endure through hardships. And because of that, if we think about this before we read the piece, we'll know why we're actually reading. And if we can get this abstract concept down of purpose, we can then just say, good, what's the textual evidence that I saw that got me to the understanding that's delivered in the prompt to me, or at least partially delivered in the prompt to me. And then you can just say, great, I can now explain how this text got me to understand that, especially if I were the intended audience. Okay. Now you're not, so we'll have to pray dress up, but we'll talk about that when we get to um, point number six. So anyway, number one, we want to remember that we want to break down the prompt 
For the rhetorical situation, we want to specifically pinpoint who the audience is. That's going to help us a little later on. And we want to try to create a question from what we're commanded to do. And that's finding the word analyze, going to find to and then the verb, and then saying, what can't I know? And once again, they do typically give you some element of purpose in the prompt itself to help you kind of get there. All right, let's move on to number two. Number two is really quite simple, but that is I want to encourage you to just use your thesis statement as an intro paragraph. That does not mean you don't have an intro paragraph, but you should just use your thesis as your intro paragraph. And I am going to tell you why. Because as an AP reader, which I am, so you can trust me, I will hardly remember your full, well-developed intro paragraph by the time I get to your paper. In fact, if you're going to spend time writing um, information that's not in a fully analytical paragraph like your body paragraphs, you want to leave that time for your conclusion because a strong conclusion is kind of like leaving a glass slipper. I've got a video about conclusions and it's listed in the links down below. In fact, there are many videos about these seven steps that will also be down there as well. So anyway, your thesis can work as your intro paragraph. Yes, you will have an intro paragraph that is one sentence long, but if it is a strong sentence that will guide your whole paper, you don't have to waste your time thinking of what some teachers call a hook. I prefer to call it a web. You don't have to deal with any of that. It's just boom, thesis, and let's get into analysis. As a reader, I know that I prefer that. I tell my kids to do the same thing every year, and every year, particularly with question two, my students score the best. Point number three that I'd like you to remember is that I want you, or I should say, readers want you to leave the language ethos, pathos, and logos at home. Do not use those words in your essay. They mean almost nothing, especially if you say the author uses ethos to build his character. Okay, so the author you know, appeals to character to build his character. Congratulations, you've said nothing. Oh yes, some more language to leave at home is pulls on the heartstrings. No, we are not pulling on the heartstrings here. Tell us what the emotions really are. Let me give you an example. If you see an ASPCA commercial and you see that picture of the pug that's behind the cage with the scars on his or her face, you don't want to say, oh, the ASPCA uses pathos. No, you want to say they show a disparate dog or they show a beaten dog in order to get individuals to feel sad for that puppy. Yes, that's going to be the way you want to talk about it. Notice how I did not say pathos there or pathos. You could say it either way. So we do not want to say ethos, pathos, or logos in our paper. We want to actually say something. If a person gives his or her work history in order to make him or her seem like the best candidate for the job, that's how you write about the ethical appeal. You don't say ethos. You say the, or, the person highlights his or her work history in order to showcase his or her credentials to get that job. That is how you want to write precisely about that. Next, I want to point out that in your thesis and in your body paragraphs, I, you do not want to use the word use when you make your verbs. So when you talk about rhetorical choices, please do not say that the author uses a metaphor or uses parallel structure. And the reason why is exemplified uh, in a video that is linked below, but I'm going to exemplify it again, and it comes with my wedding ring. Right now, I am using my wedding ring to do a magic trick. It's right here, by the way. All right, I am using my wedding, my wedding ring to throw it up and down. However, it does not convey any meaning at all. But when I actually wear my wedding ring, it shows that I am married. So using my ring doesn't do anything. But using the better verb, which would be wearing my wedding ring, that's when things have meaning. So instead of saying using a metaphor, if you're the type of person that searches for the metaphor, no, use a word like compare or contrast. Instead of saying uses parallel structure, no, what is the author actually doing in, as a choice? It's going to be the word the author is repeating such and such. So because of that, we want to use powerful verbs. If you look at some of my other videos, you'll notice that I have documents there that can actually give you an entire list of powerful verbs. Next, when it comes to topic sentences, those are those first sentences of your body paragraphs. You want to make sure that you have not only the choice in your topic sentence, but also why that choice is being made. 
The reason why is because rhetoric is looking at how language creates abstract ideas. So if we have the choice, that's going to be our concrete language. We want to then pair that with the abstraction, which is why the author is using it. So every topic sentence should have what and why. Let's go back to think about that ASPCA commercial again. If I say the ASPCA presents a beaten puppy, period, well, why? Okay, I've got the concrete, I don't have the meaning. So what I need to do is I need to add that why, and the easiest way to do so is by putting the words in order to in your topic sentences. So try this out. The ASPCA presents a beaten puppy in order to move the audience to sympathy. I have a what and a why, and that's gonna create a strong, strong body paragraph or potentially create one. And the reason why is because you're gonna describe that picture of the beaten puppy, and then for your commentary, you're going to explain how that would actually move the audience to feel bad for that puppy, and then eventually move to support the ASPCA. That topic sentence outlines that. So you wanna make sure you have a what and a why in every topic sentence for that. Now, like I said, you can use the word in order to for that. Now, once you create a topic sentence, you're going to add your textual evidence based on the choice that you said from the text. And the next thing that you need to do is you need to provide commentary. So this leads me to point number six. You want to make sure that you use cause and effect language as much as possible in your commentary. You might say the ASPCA presents an abused puppy in order to get the audience to feel sympathetic. Here's where it's seen. And then after that, you're going to say something along the lines of, and this would move the audience to be sympathetic. No, you have not provided commentary. But at the end of that sentence, if you put the word because, it would force you to provide commentary. So now we have, oh, here's a description of this abused puppy. This would move people to be sympathetic because... And now you're forced to actually explain how that would move people because individuals don't like to see innocent beings suffer. And in knowing that these beings are suffering, they typically want to help. Individuals then know that by funding the ASPCA, they can help these, these puppies um, get better and heal up. So they're more than willing to do so because people want to feel good. Uh, about being a hero and a savior for innocent beings. That's how it works. Now, because is not the only word that you should be using in your commentary, all cause and effect language is open. So we have because, since, due to, so, consequently. These are the types of words that are going to prompt us to provide commentary. If you've been struggling with commentary in the past, I want to encourage you as you write, when you get to the end of a sentence, if the word because isn't always in it, see if you can put the word because there. And if the answer is yes, then write it there and then continue your commentary. If you're afraid about being too repetitive, like I said, there are synonyms to because that you can use, such as due to, since, so that. All of this language that creates cause and effect commentary. It's important to use cause and effect language as well because when we talk about rhetoric, we're talking about what's the effect of the language. So it only makes sense that we put cause and effect language in our commentary. Point number seven, and this is the last point that I'm going to give as a tip, is that when you write a conclusion, do not just restate your thesis. Do not just reword your thesis. What you want to do is you want to make your, your conclusion about ideas. When you make your conclusion about ideas, you are going to shift from the ideas of the piece to a universal application in our lives today. That is, you are trying to exemplify why this piece that we're reading on our AP exam is actually applicable to who we are as people today. An example would be uh, the Abigail Adams letter. I think that was from 2014. Um, and the Abigail Adams letter, you might say, but that was written in the 1700s. What does that have to do with us today? Well, guess what? Moms still love their children. Moms still encourage their children. And so now we can look at how she encouraged her child and say, this is how parents should act when they write letters. And if we can have a nice universal conclusion, what that's going to do is create a nice greater context of understanding of why you've read and analyzed this piece. And that's going to be sophisticated. Now, with all of these steps, right, the first one is use the prompt in order to get as much information as you can. Number two is use only the thesis for your intro so that you don't waste time. Number three, leave ethos, pathos, and logos at the door. Number four, make sure that you use verbs that are not the word use. In fact, you should never use use unless you're telling people not to use use. 
Okay, number five, have a what, that would be the choice, and a why, that would be the effect in every topic sentence. You can do that by using uh, the phrase in order to. Number six, use cause and effect language in your commentary. And number seven, make sure that you have a universal conclusion. All of these steps, right, can actually be found in other videos that I have linked down below if you want things in more detail. But this is just a quick review of seven tips that you can actually think about and consider before your AP exam, and you can score very well on this rhetorical analysis paper. I always want to thank you for watching the video here. I encourage you to either like uh, the Garden of English on Instagram, subscribe down below. We're trying to hit 1,000 subscribers. I think we're at about 750 right now. Also, you can support the Garden of English in a, multi a, mul in a multitude of ways. You can see the links down below for ways to do that. One of those is getting a t-shirt. Here is one of our t-shirts, our famous flamingo here, um, that correlates with the Jennifer Price prompt, the best prompt ever put out on the AP exam, by the way. Um, but you can look at the merch down there to help support as well. Otherwise, just give us a like. Don't feel like you're obligated to support, of course. Um, monetarily that is because we're doing these videos for free and we actually want to help you out. If you have questions, put them in the comments below. I will try to respond to them, but based on my AP Lit videos, I had tons of questions before test day. There's no way I could respond to all of them, but I will try. Um, and that is that. So I hope you all have a great day. I hope in next week you guys have a great test day and happy AP. -ing.